Hey guys, I'm Eddie Joe, and in this particular video, I'm going to be talking about this whole free tuition business that's going on at NYU. As a background to those of you who don't know me or who are tuning into this channel for the first time, my name is Eddie Joe. I am a critical care uh, physician who has my background in internal medicine, so I think I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here, although I will never pretend to know everything. Leave comments below if you disagree with me or agree with me. I'd love to chat with you all about the topics that I'm going to approach, because it may be controversial. Let's go. Let's talk about it. Um, I decided to do this video because I've been seeing all these headlines on both, you know, the news, actual major news outlets. Also, I see it on social media, on the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the Instagrams, which I'm on all three of them. And it's riled up a lot of people, made a lot of people very excited. It's uh, it's honestly a great thing. I'm very happy that this is a, this is uh, this is actually going on right now. And I just want everybody to know what my background thoughts are on it. Yeah, it's just something to think about. Uh, I think this definitely merits discussion, and I think that there's also some misleading information that's out there that's being provided by the major news outlets that I want to discuss and I want to show you. Ultimately, I do think that you should think independently. Um, I encourage you to do your own research and make your own decisions. I, I want you to double check everything that I'm saying and really think about some of the questions that I pose because a lot of times people think, take things on the media at face value and they don't actually look at the root ideology of all this stuff. And talking about the root ideology of stuff, part of what I do in my medical practice is try to find out the root ideology of everything. Got to find out the cause as to what made that person sick, why the antibiotics aren't working, why the ventilator changes, why, well, why the patient is giving me trouble on the ventilator. I got to think about the root cause of everything. And this particular perspective, I've applied it to mostly everything in my life. And um, how I apply it to this particular uh, scenario where we're talking about the uh, free education, the free education that these, these very fortunate individuals at NYU are going to get, for the next couple of years. I took the same perspective and that's what I'm gonna discuss in this video. First of all, I wanna congratulate all these kids at NYU. And I call you all kids because you're all probably younger than me, but congratulations to you all. This is a great honor, this is a great gift that you've received. Um, a lot of people are you know, gonna be looking at you to be the, the leaders now in with regards to how you compose yourself we all have those friends in undergrad and who in medical school started quote treating themselves with student loans and buying boats cars all fancier cars than they needed a more lavish lifestyle please 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 don't don't use this opportunity to take out loans for those uh for those things although excuse me you can do whatever you want with your life i mean i think you have personal responsibility you're obviously a brilliant person to get into nyu in the first place i know i would have never gotten into nyu uh, and I'm excited for you and your future and continue to make everybody proud. So cheers to you. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that's going on behind me to remind me of everything I wanted to talk about. But one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I wanted to elaborate on after reading numerous articles on the internet about this, about this whole free tuition thing is that free isn't necessarily free. And in this context, people, people are saying that this is something that other universities need to adopt to bring down costs for medical students, etc. But what's failed to be recognized in many articles, and I'm going to go through some of them later on in this video, is the fact that they don't, they don't say where this money came from. And that's quite disturbing to me because people think that it's just NYU being nice. And while I definitely tip my hat to the people at NYU who helped organize this and who helped secure these funds, these funds were accumulated via donations. These were voluntary transactions. It wasn't through taxpayer dollar, which I'm totally against uh, taxpayer dollar. And you can get mad at me, you know, in the comments below. But I don't think that taxpayers should pay the burden for medical students, um, especially when that is a career that, you know, we do have the opportunity to make that money back versus something else that. But anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that. But this was private donations that. Are funding are funding this this free tuition so it's not really free it's a it's a gift and I really like to tip my hat to those main donors who some would call the one percent and you know that's a that's a demographic and I hate all those demographics and not, not necessarily demographics but that uh, gross categorization of individuals based on their social economic status but there is great disdain for this one percent but you know what this one percent is what paid for this 
free medical school. So you celebrate the free medical free medical school on one side, but then you hate the one percent. That's I think these are good things at the end of the day because they end up helping out the they end up helping out these kids, and it, it was really frustrating that I had to dig pretty deep to find that information. And I give uh, I give a hat tip to the organizers at the university who who helped secure these funds. I also tip my hat to the actual donors. Now that we have all this information, we need to take a step back. And that was, this is the primary intention of this video. And we all know about these skyrocketing costs of higher education. And primarily, you know, if you're in this, if you're watching this video, you may have something to do with medicine. And so you may sit back and wonder why, why is medical school so, so expensive in the first place? And if you take an economics perspective to it, you could say, okay, it's supply and demand, because that's basically how economics in a capitalistic society, which I don't believe we are in a true capitalistic society here in the United States. But if you have a demand for medical schools and you know a big demand, and you have a small supply of medical schools, then that's going to make the cost go up. And I think that that's something that needs to be looked at because I, on, I honestly wonder what are the factors in place, and I've looked this up, but I want you to look it up. What are the factors that are in place that are inhibiting the creation of medical schools? And therefore, you know, making medical schools be created internationally, like in the Caribbean, Central America, South America, etc. Um, but what are the factors that are in place that are limiting these schools in the first place? Okay, because it has to be some sort of regulation, some sort of government intervention. Because if this was a true capitalistic, I can't even speak, capitalistic society, then you know there are a lot of people in this country who have a lot of money, and they would basically go ahead and start creating medical schools in other places, and therefore the supply would meet the demand, and therefore cost should come down. But there's something holding down the medical schools and the medical school creation that is not apparent to the eye unless you clearly look into it. So I encourage you to do so. The other thing that um, that I wanted to mention along those lines is the whole issue with student loans. I do encourage you to look a little bit into the history and it's easy to Google this information. And we have so much information in our fingertips, but we just don't do it. But I would like for you to look into the history of student loans. Uh, it used to be and this should not be news to anybody, but several decades ago, you used to be able to have a part-time job and pay for your school. And if you wanted a loan, you'd go to a bank and ask for a loan, and the bank would pretty much vet you and see if you would study something that would allow you to pay the money back. But those institutions and that form of going to higher education kind of disappeared, and it really doesn't exist anymore. So we need to look at what interventions were taken um, from the government perspective, honestly to keep us from being able to pay for our university and our higher education pretty much straight cash. Uh, so I do recommend that you look into the history of Pell Grants and how Pell Grants have caused inflation, also how government-backed subsidized, subsidized loans using taxpayer money and, and national debt for that matter, and you know money has been printed out, out of thin air by the Federal Reserve, how these particular factors have created inflation within higher education. Because if you don't understand how that works, then you can't get, you can't find the root cause of how to solve these problems. They're looking for wealthy people to cover your costs does not fix what's causing the costs to go up anyway. I mean, it's it's something that's that's preposterous in my in my opinion. If you disagree, please leave me a comment down below, and we could we could chat a little bit about it. But I. This whole problem with the cost of loans, the whole problem with the medical schools and, and how there's a shortage of medical schools and there's so many kids who can't get into medical schools in the U.S. and they have to go to the international medical schools, um, all leads to a problem also with the bottlenecking of a shortage of residency spots. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the, in the past couple of years, there has been a growth with regards to how many residency spots are, how many residency spots exist in the United States. And you could dig around and find some data that's suggestive that there are enough residency spots for people who graduate from U.S. medical schools. But this, this basically leaves out the pa patients, the, the people such as myself who went to a foreign medical school and, um, you know, people who are very well qualified candidates for residency who don't get into residency spots. 
And if there's such a shortage of physicians and, you know, it's all physician shortage, primary care physician shortage, all these things, then what, why, why can't we create more residency spots? Who is in charge of creating these residency spots and who is in charge of funding these residency spots? And how's, how are these residency spots funded in the first place? We need to take a look at that particular information and kind of analyze what factors are in play that are kind of bottlenecking um, all of these, all of these issues. We cannot, we cannot fix the shortage by by you know not growing the amount of residency spots unless we're going to change the the qualifications for even going into primary care and that's something that's mind-blowing for a lot of people uh, i'm sure that there's a lot of people who are outside the country who are dying to get into the country because hey being in the united states is freaking great i was speaking of somebody who's lived in another country for for uh, several years uh, a lot of people would be willing to work in those rural areas for a period of time in order to uh, be welcome into this country with work visas and things like that. So that's that's something I want you to think about as well. Um, then then comes this whole this whole goodwill argument about doing primary care, and this is this is something that's a little bit tough for me to discuss. But primary care is hard, <laughs> right? And I say this as a critical care doctor who, you know, I have patients' lives in my hands every single day. I People die on me all the time, unfortunately, because I can't save everybody, and, and it's hard. A lot of people look at my job, and they're like, oh, my God, how do you do your job? It's so freaking hard. But to me, it's not hard. To me, what's hard is primary care, and it's hard for a multitude of factors. And, you know, part of the good intentions of this particular of this particular uh, free tuition is to allow people, more people to go into primary care, being pediatrics, family practice, internal medicine, you know, those, those different specialties. But we need to also look into if this would actually help because there's a significant significant salary gap between doing making 200 grand by doing pediatrics or uh, OBGYN or whatnot. I mean, you know, every every demographic, every part of the country has different prices for or different uh, salaries, whatnot. But generally speaking, internal medicine, you have a clinic, family practice, you have a clinic, you make $180,000 versus if you get into an orthopedic surgery, um, residency and then practice in that you're gonna make 400 to 500 that's two hundred thousand dollars a year difference that's a lot of money that you could be missing out on by choosing one specialty over the other in five years two hundred thousand dollars is a million dollars some people would say hey you know what I might not like orthopedic surgery that much but if I get a million dollars more over the course of five years I'm gonna go down that route versus primary care and so the money factor still plays a big 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 role and so it, you have to look at the, the nuances of primary care, which are you know, not even necessarily the money, but it's also the fact that working in primary care is hard. And the reason why it's hard is because first, the reimbursement is terrible. If you, if you submit a claim, it's gonna take a while for you to get reimbursed. You might take three to six months to get paid for some work that you did before. So even starting up your, starting up your, um, your practice is, is extremely miserable at first and in addition to that the paperwork is unbearable you know doing all these doing all these prior authorization forms uh, everything you need to do to stay within the regulations of paying for an EMR all these things are uh, things that make primary care pretty tough like to run a clinic from an administrative standpoint is extremely challenging you just to you know keep up with the regulatory burden you need to pay a bunch of people to do, just do paperwork for you all day and that's that, that takes the fun out of taking care of patients. And not only that, the, the patient care perspective, you have to see X amount of patients per day and you have your waiting rooms are always full. It's, it's a very stressful environment. It's, it's a lot of frustration. And, you know, let's say you get a patient who's sick and that patient doesn't have insurance or they don't have a good insurance and you want to try to get them in to see a specialist, let's say a colonoscopy, so to speak, for a 50 year old patient. It, it's challenging because that patient might not have the money for it and then the primary care doctor is a good person who's going to worry about that patient it's 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 just frustrating i really really admire people who do primary care and who do primary care well because it's something that i can never do and um you know every job has its good parts and its bad parts but but i think that these these people who do primary care are underpaid like i don't know where the additional payment is going to come from i'm not going to pretend to have that solution but that those are those are just my thoughts with regards to that. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about 
Well, I'm going to show you the articles that I that I found uh, when I was Googling all this and talk to you a little bit about some of my thoughts with regards to these articles and um, show you kind of some nuances and how I look at things and just let you into my brain a little bit. But if you have any comments about anything that I've said thus far, just leave it in the comment section below and we'll discuss. Now, looking at the looking at the articles, I, I mean, I basically Googled tuition-free medical school at NYU, as you see it right here, and then... You know, I didn't watch all these videos, but I did go through the majority of these, of these articles. And here's a New York Times article that I mentioned, which is titled Surprise Gift, Free Tuition for All NYU Medical Students. And it also talks about the annual, tu the annual tuition uh, being roughly 55 grand, there being 93 first year students. So, you know, why is this this much money? That's kind of what I want you. Why, has, why have the prices been inflated so much that it's that much money? I find it funny that it says that the plan does not cover room and board fees. It's like, okay, come on, you guys are getting free tuition. Why do you, why does this article need to make the point to talk about how it's not, they're not getting this amount of money back, but whatever. That's besides the point. This CNN article over here talking about how um, NYU makes tuition free is possibly the worst article of all of them, where what they do is once again, they talk about the cost of tuition, how NYU is awesome, good job, good job NYU. but talks about the average debt and how it scares people away, but this article does not at all talk about who who gave the the scholarship. And you know, I think that they should talk about who who provided the funds for this. Now this this USA Today uh, article is possibly one of the other worst ones because it talks about how much this medical school costs, but it does not talk about why medical school costs as much as it does, you know. Um, Let's move on. It talks about other other programs that have offered such things. I, th I thought that this was pretty interesting that they talk about how the U.S. military, uh, using this this medical school that's in the dust of Maryland, talks about how you could get paid for medical school if you join the military. But my thoughts on that are it'll end up being a wash at the end of the day because when you work for the military, as I have friends who currently work for the military right now you you're basically working at a discount so this money yes you might earn at least 60 grand per year while in medical school when you're doing this uh seven years of active duty after graduation you're making a lot less money than what you would make in the in the free market so those are my thoughts with regards to that article now one of the things that i really don't like looking at this this column that was on pbs is it talks about how tuition alone four years in medical school has increased fourfold in the past decades but it doesn't tell you why it really doesn't explain why um, it also talks about how application to medical schools exceed the available seats and you know this is why i wonder from a capitalistic perspective why don't we uh, create more medical schools why doesn't somebody create more medical schools now, I find that this, this particular uh, article talks about how minorities, and, and I say this as a minority myself, and I hate when people talk about minorities because I like to be an individual. I don't like to be part of a group. I don't like to be bulked in with other individuals. It talks about how only 8% were African-American, Hispanic, American Indian, or Native Alaskan, even though we make up, and I say we once again, or not once again, but I say we because I'm part of this group over here, but it says we make up 33% uh, of the U.S. population. Now, I find that these statistics are misleading because it's supposed to say that we are underrepresented compared to other students, but it doesn't talk about what students are in the greater proportion. Like, for example, the, the not 18%, it does not speak about the pa patients, once again. It does not speak about the people who are, for example, from Japan, who are from China, who are from the Asian countries. It does not talk about people who are from India, it does not talk about people from uh, the Middle East. And I think that those, those populations are pretty well represented in medical school because honestly, the, the, those, those guys are brilliant. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's something that might be misleading and it might be trying to bait people into arguments and making people feel like they should be entitled. And I think that that's, that's just not the right way to go. But anyway, what else did I see here? Health disparity, there was something else. Uh, that I want to mention about this article, income, burnout. Okay, no, I don't think that, that was, there was anything else there. I want to talk about that. This particular article in Forbes, which talks about NYU, which makes medical school tuition free. There was, uh, I think this is the one that, that mentioned that 
this family, which was the family of the co-founder of Home Depot, gave $100 million to the fund. This also talks about the pay disparities, where pediatricians could earn this much money per year, internists this much, neurosurgery, over 600 grand orthopedic surgeons, half a million dollars. So that's where I pulled up some of the data behind, excuse me, some of the data behind um, the pay gap dis discrepancy. So then on the Atlantic, this article shows this very perplexed lady right here. I, I don't know if she, like the patient had a BM or something, but nevertheless, uh, it talks about the United States physician shortage of $120 million, oh, excuse me, 100, 120,000 physicians by 2013. But here's the thing. If there are all these, if we have X amount of medical schools, right? And we have people who are unable to get into medical school, then, <laughs> then how are we gonna fix the shortage? If, if our medical schools are already saturated, then reducing the debt is not the problem. The, the problem is a lack of medical schools. Is that, am I wrong? Am, am I losing my mind here? Does this not make sense? This is, th this is what I see when I read these particular articles. So anyway, my camera overheated. I guess that means that I went way too long with the way I was talking. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you learned something or at least encouraged you to look things up and try to get to the bottom of things before just celebrating things blindly. Look into the etiology of everything. That's the way I think. That's the way I try to think. I'm not going to pretend I'm always right, but I'm going to try to do the best I can. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.